The following program is a presentation of Grace Communion International and Grace Communion Seminary and is made possible by generous donations from viewers like you. Jeremy, thanks again for being with us. Uh, in the other parts of the interview, you, you've mentioned the, the particular powers of various arts and uh, the music is one of them. And I was wondering if you might demonstrate for us uh, some of those particular powers that might apply to life in general and perhaps uh, yeah, worship and things yeah. like that. Yeah. Well, we were talking earlier about knowing your medium and the danger. That some, people, some people, there's a danger that they'll think that uh, music, for instance, is a mere frill. It's, it has no theological power or substance to itself. If I hear that and I'm anywhere near a piano and I'm with Christians who worship, I quite often speak about this tune. You know, what, what a friend we have in Jesus, right? And that's the well-known tune and it's fairly upbeat and, and fun and easygoing. Uh, what, what a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and, all our sins and griefs to bear. There's not a great deal about sin and grief there, but there's plenty of cheerful joy. We set it to this tune. Everything changes, because this is heavy. It is dark. We are reminded that he is our friend, but he's the friend who's borne our grief the griefs which we bear. So march, march that's, that's a kind of plodding, marching thing. It's a different thing. Now, the words are exactly the same, but they're now inflected, nuanced in all sorts of different ways through the music. Film composers know this, of course, it's just taken the church a little time to wake up <laughs> to that, because I think you can flip around these tunes and it makes no difference, as if the tunes were simply varnish on what we could have you know, could see quite well otherwise. No, the varnish can change the way you look at that wood very dramatically. I've taught theology for most of my life, uh, adult life, I suppose, and I found over and over again that music has distinctive powers to help us not only feel and sense things, but actually understand them as well. And one powerful way, I think, in which that's the case is when it comes to thinking in Trinitarian terms, which is very much an interest, I know, of, of course, of your own. Part of the difficulty we've had in Christian theology in thinking about the Trinity is we will tend to rely very much on our eyes. And the, the way we look at the world, things will occupy bounded locations, but they can't be in the same place at the same time and visible as different things. So a patch of red on a canvas on a, uh, that a painter's put there and a patch of yellow on the same space, if you try to put those two together, you, either the red, yellow hides the red or it could be the other way around, red hides yellow, or the paint's wet, they merge into orange. So in the world that we see, therefore, you can't see two different things in the same space at the same time as different. In the world of sound, you can and do all the time. So that note, or any note that I would play, that note fills the whole of your heard space. You don't say of what you hear, ah, it's there, but it's not there. There's no interval between anything. It is just there in the whole of your heard space. If I add another note, that second note fills the same space. And yet, you hear it as distinct, undeniably two notes. In the world that we hear, things can be in and through each other. They can sound in and through each other. They can interpenetrate. Now we go to John's Gospel, you know, all that language about the Son in the Father, the Father in the Son. I love that in language, what Richard Balkan calls the in one anotherness of Father and Son. That is very hard to draw. And when I'm in uh, teaching, uh, I often, at that point, I would take out a a pen and give it to students and say, would you like to draw that for me? And of course, no one does. And not even the, those Bibles that have all those illustrations will try to demonstrate that visually. It's very, very hard. 
but it's very easy to hear. Because what you're hearing there is two sounds in and through each other. But it can go further than that, of course, because if this was a, a real piano, then there would be two strings here, and they would be setting each other off. Because one string will tend to resonate with another if they have what's called a harmonic series in common. So the more this resonates, the more that resonates. So now between those two, you have the father and son who love each other, who mutually establish each other, you might even say, you know, in quite some Trinitarian theology. Uh, but then, of course, now we're into the Trinity. I'm sure you've got there already. This is a, a three-note chord is by far, in my own view, by far the most potent way of not only sensing, but also beginning to comprehend intellectually that all that in one another's language that pervades the New Testament. Now, the trouble is, a lot of Trinitarian theology has over relied on the I, and therefore, well, what can you see? You can see oneness, you can see three separates, or you can go kind of modalist, you can think, well, there's one in the middle, but three on the outside. You can see how so many of the struggles of the church with the Trinity have been because they've over relied on the I. But if we begin to think sonically, that isn't the case. Here we have a kind of sonic space and a mutually resonating space that opens up the Trinity in extraordinary ways. And then, of course, what happens is other notes around that will resonate with that and get caught up with it. And you can understand, therefore, participation in the Trinity through the Spirit as a form of attunement. We are tuned into God. And you can then see sin or think of sin as a matter of being out of tune with God radically so, and unable to communicate, therefore. So what, what the world of sound has done for me is made, help me rethink all uh, uh, that area and also reread the history of doctrine. I think there's a lot of work to be done, but it's a lovely thought that something as simple as a chord or something as simple as something you could strum on that guitar in the corner of your room that you've neglected, it's just sitting there waiting. And if you ever preach on Trinity Sunday, as you do it in my, in my con um, denomination. I'm telling you, it's a lot, I think it's a lot better to be using that kind of um, metaphor, or sonic metaphor, an embodiment, you might even say, not just a metaphor, uh, than many of the visual illustrations we typically trot out and confuse people with. Also, we tend, with the Trinity, we tend to present the Trinity as a problem to be solved, you see, that way. It becomes a mathematical problem to be solved. That's not a problem to be solved. It's something to enjoy. You've been watching You're Included, a production of Grace Communion International.